peace and sustainability. Our session involves practicing artists, although I, the chair, Sarah Wilson, I'm an art historian, and it's called Contemporary Artists, New Visions from Old Histories. And two of the key questions are, how do artists interact with history and how do they plot a conversation to revisit the past to build a new future? The first thing we're going to do is, of course, introduce our panel, who are from all over the world in various time zones. And I'm going to begin with Annie Albali. Annie, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Annie, um, and I am a multidisciplinary artist working out of uh, Sausalito, California, and also a professor at the Sierra Nevada College MFA IA program. Lovely. And Dina? Uh, hi, my name is Dina Danish. I'm an uh, artist. I'm calling here from Amsterdam. I'm uh, also a teacher at Rietveld Academy and the Royal Academy in The Hague. Lovely. And Christina? Yes, with the microphone on. So, hi, yes, I'm Christina Erdei. I'm from Budapest uh, and I live in Hungary. I just finished my doctoral studies and I'm a photographer and multimedia artist. And uh, I work at the University of Moholy Nagy. Uh, it's a University of Art and Design. Yeah, shortly. This Lovely. And Patricia? Yeah, hi, my name is Patricia Lambertus and I'm uh, mostly into site-specific installation and uh, I make like uh, room filling digital collage. Um, yeah, and sometimes I'm also in, in, uh, in teaching and right now I have a summer academy exchange between uh, Bremen, that's in Germany, and Durban, South Africa. And Babs. Hi, I'm Babs Reingold. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I do large installations. I'm coming to you from St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, and I think that's one. Okay, so just last but not least, I just say that I'm an art historian, Sarah Wilson. I teach at the Courtauld Institute of Art in the University of London. Uh, and although I'm an art historian, you might think that's not relevant today, but today I did an examination with a girl who's been working in between Ukraine uh, and Venice. She's putting on a big exhibition of Ukrainian modernism in uh, the thyssen bormisen uh, Capital Museum in Madrid, which will travel to Cologne. And today I learned from her the phrase exterminated renaissance. We talked about the Hodomor, the, the um, death from famine of six million Ukrainians in the 30s, and the way that the artist she's focusing on, Mikhail Boychuk, passed from um, nationalism to Bolshevism to socialist realism, and we saw in her presentation portraits of uh, weeping, mourning people, mourning a pogrom, and everything we do, in fact, is extremely contemporary, but I'm not going to be giving the presentation. So we've moved to our first presentation, which is in fact linked to the idea of destruction. And we're firstly beginning with Babs Reingold, speaking to us from St. Petersburg, Florida. Babs, over to you. Okay, um, I'm gonna share my screen with some images. Okay, I'm going to read so that I stay on my time allotment. Uh, anyway, again, I'm Babs Rheingold, and um, in thinking about artists in history, a Kierkegaard quote comes to mind. Life can only be understood backward, but must be lived forward. As an artist, we probe new meaning, new directions, while the works of hundreds of artists simmer within us, an underpinning upon which any idea rests or, re or resists. My forward for the past 16 years has been climate change and, and its effect upon the environment. It is the existential crisis of our time. This focus began after witnessing Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and shortly after hearing anthropologist Jared Diamond lecture on the demise of the past societies. It was Dr. Diamond's comment on the demise of Easter Island from his book, collapse, how societies choose to fail or succeed, that stuck with me. What do you imagine the Islander was thinking when he chopped down the last tree? These two incidents paved a journey of investigation into the links of greed as it affects the environment 
and one of its major aftermaths, poverty. Poverty is personal. As a young teenager, my father's illness landed us in a subsidized housing project for three years. This period lingered in my mind and manifested in a series of room size installations and sculptures. My approach was the focus on the negative effects of climate change. Among them was the last tree. Uh, this is what you see now on, on your screen, large. Um, the installation first showed in Soho, New York at the East State Cultural Foundation, and later an updated version had a six month view at the Birchfield Penny Art Center in Buffalo, New York. The last tree uh, it includes one lone tree and 193 tree stumps. Each of the pales symbolize one of the world's recognized countries of the UN. The stumps and the lone tree are constructed of rust and tea stained silk organza, cheesecloth, and caustic string, yarn, thread, and, and they're stuffed with human hair. They sit in a pail surrounded by a bed of human hair. A video of a tree being first chopped, then chainsawed, looms above the stumps. The video includes an eerie soundtrack created by artist Lynn Culbertson with the rhythmic sound of chopping of a tree, which is interrupted by Diamond's, quote, last tree remark. The current series, Hair Nest, is, and I stuck in one of me working on it so you could get an idea of the scale. The current series, Hair Nest, is a conscious attempt to flip that script to the positive. So now I'm trying to not think of all the destruction, which Sarah said my topic would be. But um, anyway, it's a conscious of the script to the positive, to reveal the beauty of an individual tree through the process, process of drawing. These drawings detail an individual tree's skin or bark. Throughout the hours of rendering each, I am consciously reminded of a tree's resilience to withstand destruction human action, and conversely, uh, uh, to withstand the destruction of human action, and conversely, our duty to care for these trees, a critical, sustainable infrastructure of the planet. To destroy the trees is to eventually destroy ourselves. The date four pieces in the Hair Nest series are complete. Each contains a seven-foot drawing of a tree on layers of sanded modeling paste on panel, an actual branch or a cast fabricated branch, felted or stitched, a branch projecting from the drawing or laying on the ground. Other natural upcycled and salvaged materials sit at the base of the drawing and a nest is constructed from a year of my daily hair loss. It's either nestled in a branch or fallen to the materials at the base. The series incorporates 10 years of hair loss and is essentially another time marker. Most of my work involves hair, the loss of it, collection of it, and the transformation of it. In the last tree, hair is transformed into self-sculpture. As noted in these hair nest series, the nest is constructed specifically from a year of my own hair loss, and it places me with the tree essentially physically, symbolically, and metaphorically, as hair contains our complete DNA. More so, hair contributes to the definition of self as medium, again, metaphorically and literally. The perseverance of trees may be thought of in the same vein. Scientists record 22 benefits of a single tree. They encompass hair, they encompass air quality, climate change, erosion control, and food. Tree markings, scars and burns, and the tree ring dating provide yearly climate history. The markings speak of an existence affected by elements beyond their control, drought, fire, disease, and of course humans, yet trees endure. I believe the hair nest pieces deliver a message about the vitality of unseen labor, much as nature appears to be unseen, yet vitally imperative to our well-being. And again, I put myself into these pieces so that you could get a sense of the scale and the size, and then I'll just end quickly with this is uh, an installation that I'm about to uh, show in 2022 in October and um, it's called Fell Tree and I'm using upcycle bricks, drawings of trees, silk organza columns uh, of, of um, the stitched uh, shapes of, um, of, of trees and real stumps and pails 
and the trees are wrapped in silk organza. And I will end with that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Babs. Thank so let's you. Go, thank you. Let's pass on to Christina, hoping that we're all going to be able to bring all this together at the end. Christina. Yes, I hope I can share my screen. And... Uh, Yeah, so I always interested in the narrative potential in art and photography. I started working on projects that are passed on in the form of stories. Uh, recognition of different cultural traditions and values is important in choosing the topic I work with and also important the method I use. So usually I work with sociologists or anthropologists together. I work with communities in Budapest that uh, do not participate in official representational processes, so they are exposed to them. And uh, I'm trying to make room for self-representation and critical thinking. Of course, this is not an easy task. There are many bad examples from the last uh, 20 years. Uh, for my practice is important the long-term thinking and the use of oral history and also the work with a cultural historical context. Uh, I would like to show you um, one of uh, uh, my projects. It's a Jumbui on the outskirts of the city. This is an installation view of it. And in this case, we reconstructed uh, the, st uh, the history of a nearly 100-year-old, recently demolished block of buildings based on the stories of former residents. residents. And the neighborhood was a unique subculture, but it concentrated and reproduced destitution. So the local government decided to destroy the buildings. Uh, there was only uh, the image suggested by the media so our group uh, carried out uh, joint research to get a more complex picture of the history of the neighborhood. Uh, we made interviews, collected old articles, archival documents, and our long-term goal was to contribute to alleviating the problems of poverty and social inequality. Uh, we published um, our results on a website and we also published the fanzine. Uh, this is the fanzine, I mean just a detail of it. And we did an exhibition where the interviews, portraits and other works related to the project show the fuller picture, I hope, of the place and the families live there. And also the people were able to see, I mean, the viewer, viewers of the exhibition were able to see the real opportunities for the inhabitants of the neighborhood and the barriers that affect their further lives. Uh, okay, and this is, uh, this is another thing. Uh, I also work as assistant professor and this other project I would like to show you was a university project. Um, the title of the project is Spherical Stories. Uh, I was, uh, it was a semester assignment for students at the university. We worked with people living around the square in Budapest, in the city center. It's a quite interesting square. And the students collected stories from people and then they created spherical videos. So 360 degrees videos using archival and new images based on personal stories. When we were done with the videos, we went back to the square uh, with these uh, MetaQuest glasses. So the inhabitants were able to view the spherical stories in the same square. Even if the past has become a virtual experience, they could also incorporate the past into the present. 
So basically, uh, I usually work with the small communities to draw their attention to the importance of their own stories. And uh, I hope this practice can help people to build uh, cooperative communities in the in the future. So thank you so it. much. That was really very moving and interesting. And I think now we're going to move on to Annie, aren't we? Uh, Annie, I'll buy yes. yes, yes. If some, I don't know if anybody in the panel is able to share that website that I um, shared in the chat. Um, that would be oh, really Annie. wonderful. But if not, it's okay. So, let me see if I can. You want me to I've, see if I can? I've open it? it. Okay. I've or, or, it. Or, got it. Thank you. So, if you're able to share, yeah, that's a very clever idea. Yes, I've opened it. Can you share it? Can you share your screen then? Um, I, I'm just unable to share my screen. So I don't know. I don't know. I would have thought everybody could individually click on the website link in the chat. Okay, okay. that's fine talk. too. Okay. So um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist and my work often explores new ways to witness a landscape and its relationship to human and non-human worlds um, by examining the cultural context from which they're born and the layers of manipulation that shape them. And so this often involves lots of archival and field research, a lot of play and community engaged projects. But the specific project that I wanted to share with you today is called We Become Vessels, which is a video based installation. Um, so it's a series of silk printed flags, rock sculptures and about a um, 12 minute or yeah, 12 minute video that's there. Um, and this specifically responds to uh, the geologic time and the military in and the relationship of geologic time to the military infrastructure that is present at the Marin Headlands. So after colonization, the Marin Headlands became a rancheria and then was slowly given over to the US military. And you can see this direct relationship of all of the materials that they have used from the landscape into the, um, the military bunkers, the concrete, um, and how the military has so clearly changed and altered the landscape there. So I'm, um, specifically interested in what um, what organisms formed at the Marin Headlands. So a lot of the uh, or a lot of the rocks there are formed from radiolarian chert, which are small little organisms that eventually went down to the bottom of the ocean and um, became and became like silica and hardened. And so thinking about these structures a little bit differently as like things that used to be these like living, breathing organisms. Um, and so I think, you know, what was presented previously was very moving about witnessing the present, but with a very long view of the past. Um, and so the work tries to look at like our relationships of our, of our living bodies and relate back to these, um, these bunkers by, with this new lens. Um, so that, that's that's what I wanted to share today. It's a beautiful thing. Could I just ask you for the benefit of our audience? When you say mm -hmm. the Marin Headlands, mm -hmm. that's um, is that it, that's presumably in Israel. You haven't you haven't quite been very geographically specific. The Marin Headlands is in Marin County of California. Oh, I see. I'm terribly sorry, but some people, you know, like like well, me for example. Uh, we just aren't so familiar yeah, yeah. with some of the no, geography. So yeah, this is actually geography. Yeah, okay. This is this is your local, well, California based. Yeah, yeah. and so what's interesting about this um, specifically is that this was like sort of like the last American frontier for defending America from the Russians. So you actually still have night decommissioned oh. night missiles that are still present in the landscape. I mean, the landscape is extremely inciting um, and very violent, even though it is just exceptionally beautiful. And so I actually think that part of this work is trying to take off a little bit of the beauty filter and see the violence that's embedded in the landscape as well. That's great. No time to cover conversation, but did the Russians ever attack or anything? Is it, it's all no. defense or no? It was okay. all defense, yes. Okay, yeah. well, anyway, that was very, very pertinent and surprising. So I think we're going on now to Dina. 
Tina, are you here? Oh, we have, I go out of my, um, yeah, I go out of my, that was a really brilliant idea, actually, to put the websites in the, in the chat. Tina. And I, and I will share yours as well. Let me get, I'm, I'm doing it. So, Dina, would you like us to go onto your website now in the chat? Uh, yes, would be nice. I thought, is, is Patricia to go first? No. Um, uh, I've got, yeah, Patricia, that's right. Yeah. yeah I sorry, think sorry. It's yeah, just repetition. Know. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Okay, okay. I can't, no, no um, my Adobe doesn't work with the system. It's really kind of saying no way. I don't know, maybe. So shall we? Maybe shall we, we yeah, click I, on your website. I can, uh, I can share yours, Patricia. If oh, you'd okay. Like. Thank you. So this is one word I just from my website. Hang on. All right. Let me just let me let me make it happen. <laughs> let me make it happen. It's normally <laughs> like on Zooms everywhere it works. I don't know why this. Hopefully, of... yeah. Hopefully, my computer won't explode. <laughs> ah, there you go. Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, first I want to start my, my um, <clears throat> okay, I'm into this uh, room filling installation and actually it started with the, the theme, started from uh, two sides, like one, the one thing is uh, from wallpaper, so I used wallpaper as a color and I um, like to, to make it as a collage or a decollage and on the other side, I have the theme of um, political interest, and this comes actually from, I wanted to share this picture of the Napoleon wallpaper, but anyway, next time. <laughs> because uh, I found on my research um, a very interesting uh, historical wallpaper of this um, Napoleon Austerlitz war, and this is really so uh, undecorative that I was thinking, who's going to put, put this decorative wallpaper in a kind of living room? So, and that's <clears throat> why my my question is always in this installation. It's like always a little bit of interior. I'm putting it into a kind of a room which I have for installation. And at the first time you see it, it looks. Uh, that's what the most people always always tell me. Like they are attracted to it and they they find it very interesting and nice. And so they come closer and look to it. And then you see this little um, cracks and you have weapons there. You have like really irritating moments which you can only see in details. And that's for me the most interesting things to because when I made this re research about um, the war wallpaper. So I went to all these uh, funny museums, like a tank museum. And the most interesting thing was for me, not the tanks and not the museum, but like the reaction from the people who are watching tanks or watching military things. Because for me, <clears throat> it's like really a historical thing and I'm always transform it into the present so I can't <clears throat> look at it and say oh this is a, such an interesting machine I'm always like I have this image of killing people and what the machines did already and I'm not able to make selfies in front of the tank like the most people are just going there like in a zoo or just um feeling actually like they're going with their children and they say, ah, oh, look at this, look at this. And so that's for me the kind of history part, which I find very important to transform it into the new, into the new times or into a contemporary times so that we still get the, um, the feeling of, uh, of the beauty, but then also the cracks in the beauty and the kind of uh, disturbance. So mm. this is about it. And of course, history repeating itself with tanks. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And this actually, where it's now, it's like 
the um, story of Pompeii like this. I made this installation for, for the pavilion, a little pavilion. And <clears throat> it's too bad that you have to really be in there and to see all these details because that's that was inspired by the um, by by the Pompeii walls and the Vesuv crashing all the houses and the people and so I made a little um, um, it reminds like a remembrance of the Vesuv and try to put it into a new day. So I had also pixel clouds from Minecraft and uh, mine Vulcano stuff and so on. Oh wow. So, That's very sophisticated as well. Yeah. So let's or let's go on <clears throat> to Dina and then all the artists will have showed us their projects and we can open some wider discussion. Dina. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Um, uh, glad to be with you all here. Um, I'll uh, talk about uh, my my practice in relationship to uh, poetry and play. And uh, thanks, Babs, for sharing. Uh, I, I think if you can share the other one instead, I have like a second uh, uh, link. Uh, it's the one or sonata in Arabic pronunciation. It's called. I'll uh, share it again here. Here, I just shared it again. Um, so what I would like to talk about um, is um, uh, um, my my core interest in uh, in the making of uh, artworks and uh, how I uh, have been using uh, historical events from the past or or. Uh, poems from the past and uh, have uh, used them as material to reimagine something else uh, for now or for the future. Um, I would like to talk about poetry in specific and, uh, and about translations and mistranslations uh, and the possibilities within mistranslations, misunderstandings and miscommunications. Um, and uh, in this case here, uh, what you can see on the screen is uh, a translation of the Ur Sonata, which is uh, uh, Kurt Schwitter's uh, uh, famous um, uh, sound poem uh, that was uh, written post-Second uh, World War. Um, I am very privileged to, uh, uh, to know German myself. Uh, as well as uh, other languages, which uh, is maybe why I've had these affinities with translations and with uh, sound poetry. Uh, because uh, in, in the poem of Kurt Schwitters uh, himself, it's, uh, even though it's nonsensical and uh, uh, very much uh, uh, means uh, nonsensical means nothing at all. Uh, it very much plays with the sound of uh, words and the meaning and the tone of things, and that's ultimately what I've been fascinated by: the structure of poetry and the structure of writing, the structure of sentences, and how aggressive or how gentle or how uh, loving they may be. Uh, he has also another lovely poem called uh, "An Anna Blume." It's a love poem. It's also a nonsensical one, but it reads as love. So I'm I'm very interested in these uh, uh, tonalities. Uh, it's been very curious to me that this poem has not uh, this uh, sound piece, rather uh, the or sonata and a lot of uh, nonsensical poet poems had not been translated to Arabic, as far as I know, at least. Um, and it's been also curious to me that. Uh, uh, Surrealism existed within uh, where I was brought up in Egypt, uh, very much so. Uh, but uh, motorized poetry or sound poetry, um, I have personally not encountered and I've been trying to search for it for a very long time. Um, so I've decided to translate it myself as a way of learning and maybe of reinterpreting what uh, that uh, could lead to today as well. That maybe it will encourage me to write my own uh, um uh, sound poems uh, in Arabic. Uh, so this one here very much focuses on the structure of Kochvita's uh, 
uh, writing, um, as well as uh, the tone. So I read it in different ways. And in his instructions, uh, uh, he also uh, gave the reader the possibility to read it in different ways, while also instru instructing that uh, if it's to be read, the German version, at least it's to be read with a, a, a German uh, accent. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that's yeah. it for now. <laughs> it's so interesting because I, I teach Kurt Schwitters. I even met Ernst Schwitters' son. But oh, wow. I wanted to say that his pieces, he actually wrote in English when he was a refugee. Uh, and, um, and some of his pieces, like Anna Bloomer, we retranslated to English. But what I wanted to say specifically to bring our discussion into the present, that in Occupy, well, not Occupied, in wartime London, there was an international pen conference called Schriftsteller ohne Sprache, mm -hmm. i.e. there were many, many German refugee writers and they felt their language had been so dishonored they didn't have a language to write in. Some wrote in German secretly, he did, and some, and some people transposed their language. But there's a big and interesting problem now about the Russian cultural infrastructure, um, people avoiding Russian culture, and the problem of people who are both Ukrainian and Russian and the whole business of language. So I think that once again, with like with your tanks or like with the ecological crisis, we're constantly being brought up into the present, aren't we? And um, we've talked a little bit. It was Christina talked about teaching. I think many of us teach uh, either specifically in front of a class or teach through example because I think every time we go to an art exhibition we are learning through the examples and the meanings that are in the works we see in both group exhibitions and individual exhibitions. Uh, I just wanted to before I again ask you all to come in uh, I think there's an interesting when we when with the when we go back to the thing, how do artists interact with history there's both the the question of cultural heritage but destroyed cultural heritage and what UNESCO of course calls immaterial heritage. Immaterial heritage can be the remembrance of something like an or sonata or the remembrance of folk songs or whatever so we're also discussing in our immaterial communication with each other this relationship which I think is very interesting between material and immaterial heritages. Who'd like to come in to the discussion Somebody, please. Uh, 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 well, it's interesting. Um, I had another project that I did called uh, La Longue Dore, which uh, is uh, out of the Anna, French uh, uh, Annales School of, of what history is uh, and how they view history and the idea of this long uh, that that it that it takes place over a very long. A series of time rather than what's in the uh, the current journal or the the war of the day, for example. But this idea that there is this long arc or this long prog process that develops what history is. And um, I, at the time, was thinking of this. I, I almost put it in today and then decided, no, it's not what I'm working on. But uh, um, I, uh, it was just, it was a fascinating thing at the time. And I was thinking about how we cannot see history. We're here living it all. And we don't have a sense of it really uh, until we're able to look back. And that's why the Kierkegaard quote came to mind for me too. It's like, how, how do we progress forward versus what has gone before us? I know it's not it's it's a non sequitur to what you're asking, but I'm just jumping in because it was all the thoughts mm. that crossed my mind when we when I looked at this topic, and uh, because I think of it as a fascinating topic of how we as artists interact with history, we're constantly doing it every day. We're living history, and I think that this particular time, I was wondering if anybody else wanted to talk about it or Sarah that how I'm feeling the, the presence of history more than I think I've ever felt in my lifetime, and particularly because of the war and obviously what's going on. I'm looking at it from uh, uh, the, the view of an American, uh, uh, a, 
a United States citizen, what is it like in my country and what is it like for the rest of you? Like, are you sensing history more than you've ever sensed it before? It's kind of a crazy question, but that's my thought. <laughs> well, I mean, this girl broke down in her when when someone said something at all critical to her today after this magnificent work she'd done under such duress. She's in a very delicate and fragile situation, and she just got some news from her sister about going back to Ukraine after running away to Prague or something, just before she had to give her her research paper one or two days ago. And my colleague has been, I wasn't able to do so, but been to the actual border between Poland and uh, and um, Ukraine welcoming refugees for like three weeks doing the kind of physical stuff that we as intellectuals don't really do. I know that lots of you, uh, I, I know that being a, a practical artist involves a lot of physical work. I'm not saying you don't, but you know, doing that actual helping stuff. And um, it's very emotionally draining and peculiar for people in varying degrees. Uh, and today, of course, our, our, our headlines in The Guardian were all about how it's going to be world famine coming up because of the disruption of supply chains. I think not only with COVID, but other things, we've become much more sensitive about how our network, not just the ecological thing to do with trees in the green world, but how yeah. our network of supplies is so amazingly delicate. When you don't think of Ukraine and people starving in Africa particularly, or people in chip shops in the north of England, not you know, with the price of oil for fish and chips in England has doubled. You yes. know, it's like incredibly delicate, this wonderful little network we had, which one person can be in a position of command and you know, mess up. And the I think the analogies with the Second World War is so unbelievable at the moment. Yeah. Including yeah, all the old armor and all the old vehicles. Yeah. Well, it, that's why I'm saying that right now, I don't think I've ever been so aware of the history happening. I mean, we're living through a, an incredible time. I mean, not in a good way, but in a very bad way. And we also do this thing where we keep repeating history, which is Oh, so fascinating to me. I mean, human beings are so flawed and uh, uh, that we are all at the mercy of a few madmen is, is, and one in particular at this moment is, is beyond me. And it's beyond me that we sit here. I used to wonder back when the Germany was happening and then the rise of Nazism, I'm wondering like, why didn't anybody do anything? We're sitting there going, what, what were they doing? It's the same thing that struck me when I started to work on The Last Tree. I'm thinking, Jared Diamond is saying, standing there saying, what do you think the Islander was thinking when he chopped down The Last Tree? Like, why didn't anybody think of this? I said, how did we get here? <laughs> how is it that we are on the brink, really? World War III is going on. I mean, it's not that it isn't going on. In a sense, it really is because... He, he's destroying food. Food for worldwide is being destroyed. Hmm. I mean, it's like we're not just destroying one country. We're destroying, as you mentioned, this huge chain uh, 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 of events. What's coming? Who knows what's coming? I sound hmm. I sound hysterical, don't I? <laughs> but it feels that way to me. Uh, hmm. Anyway, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in. No, I always think of... Um... W. H. Auden's poem, September 1939, when he's just got to America, but it ends, we must love one another or die, which of course is as optimistic as the title of this whole day towards a new era of peace and sustainability. It seems to me extremely, extremely optimistic. I don't know if the seminar, you know, overall title, I don't know when it was um, decided upon. Um, yeah. And yet we too are a network and presumably all the people who participated all day are quite a strong, if we put us all together, I haven't been able to participate in all the sessions today, in fact, in any other than, than rather than this, but we do make a, we do make a very interesting kind of constellation all over the globe with different expertises. And I don't know if, if Hans, uh, you, you know, if there's going to be any summary after this, about what we can get out of it, but, um, Presumably, our networks are important in themselves. Well, Certainly, 
Yeah, I do know that all of these are recorded and you can watch them afterward. You can go yes, back indeed. at any time. Indeed. Um, and I mm. do believe that uh, Frank comes back on and uh, does some... I think there's there were, well there were summaries earlier and I don't know and then after this there's a sort of a networking thing so that you could meet some other people for the next hour after this and and then I don't know how it I don't I didn't pay attention to how it ends but the, I you know it's it's um in a, in a strange sort of way I thought about I just have thought about this topic so much uh, uh, once I was invited to participate and how um, the effects that one one solo person can have versus also groups of people can have on history and how we can affect the course of history. Uh, uh, it says, oh, your original session time has elapsed, yeah. but you can stay as long as you like. Uh, um, anyway, so I am, I'm, I'm, really wondering, you know, what it's going to be like 10 years from now, how will we look back at this time period and what will, what will we be thinking? Um, uh, and, and the ability of artists to illuminate uh, and point a finger at and um, focus on and just bring to light and have people involved and just the idea of spreading the word, what does it mean to spread the word? All of those things are always running around in my head um anybody else want to hop in and comment <laughs> uh, i just um would like to say that uh, i think the most uh dangerous thing is like um like actually napoleon did it and all the big people are doing it like they're working with stories and they're working with images. And if you see what Putin is doing in Russian, so they, it's not only the one man, it's like um, the one man who uh, stimulate the masses who wants to believe in it. I don't know why, because uh, this, and this is maybe the most important thing for artists or for every individual just to not to believe in whatever big uh, like Putin or Trump or whatever is uh, promising you and said ah then if you follow me I will give you the paradise or if you follow me I am the one who knows how it yeah. works and they are really very clever and uh, like Napoleon did it really with uh, pictures and images and he started to be, I just read it once, he was the first multimedia artist who really made like his historical thing in, in pictures. So that's why people just saw it and believed everything what they like. So, and Trump is always like doing the same, Putin is doing this like, and then cutting off the, the critical mass and I, and that it's like, I still don't understand why this really works so good, but I think it really works good. So. Well, as a, as a former New Yorker, uh, I mean, I, I knew that Trump was full of it. Uh, I lived in New York 26 years. And, uh, but um, what is staggering to me, that's the other thing. Like I said, I was thinking about how the people believed uh, Hitler, how mm -hmm. the people believe uh, and how people as a human race want somebody to solve it for them. That's a, it's a, it's a laziness and uh, the, it, the way, why artists are always so fascinating and interesting is because they're curious. You're curious about what is going on. You're curious about what you're working in and you investigate and you look into and you're not turning to somebody else to tell you the answers for something. Uh, creative people tend to want to problem solve or uh, mm -hmm. come up with their own way of doing something. And, uh, but the masses aren't that way. And uh I guess, as I mentioned, I'm just staggered by the 
uh, ignorance of so many people and also that, 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 um, that wanting someone to just solve the problems for them uh, mm -hmm. and looking to that because it's, it's, it's globally uh, this whole strongman idea, this uh, uh, wanting that one person that's going to lead the country rather than looking to yourselves to lead. Um, I don't know if that addresses what you're thinking, Patricia, but it is definitely what, mm -hmm. what has crossed my mind so much now. I'm just, I, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> I don't know if any of the rest of you are, but I am. No, um, well, two years ago, there was a conference of the International Association of Art Critics in Berlin, and the subject was populism and crowds. Yeah. And I did a little bit of research for that. I gave a paper, and it's amazing that the minute that Gustave Le Bon in France published the first book called The Psychology of the Crowds, it was immediately taken up by the military. And there was always this idea of the esprit du corps and making the whole body of soldiers think like one being and obey blindly. I mean, even now, if you don't obey, you know, that, that's yeah. you can't be a good soldier. So there's this whole thing about blind obedience and then training the military composite animal, yeah. you know, which is leading to so many deaths at the moment. And yet people feel very, very powerless, especially, you know, thousands of bereaved mothers in Russia and things, they're all completely, right. everyone feels powerless. And this is what's so dreadful. I suppose we do depend on our world leaders. I mean, poor old Macron at the end of his table, representing the whole of Europe, trying to talk to him. It's yeah. just a, a dreadful thing. Um, yeah, my husband, it was always, every time I talk about these things, he, this is a very old book, but it's called um, The True Believer. And um, it was written, uh, uh, I, I believe it was a I, Irish longshoreman or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's called the True Believer, and basically, crowds and power and um, mm -hmm. those kinds of oh, things. Yeah. The, the 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 how how people. It's 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 also cult mentality. It's uh, but but the power of a crowd and the true believer are two scary combinations. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting that you're bringing that up uh, because that is what is going on. And um, I listened, I mean, I'm a, I'm a confessed, I think I told Patricia, a confessed news junkie. So I know every twist and turn of everything that's going on. I think that makes me a, I don't know, liberal American. Okay. Yeah, but I, I hope you don't know every twist and turn of Boris Johnson's saga because uh, no. it's really more interesting <laughs> to be a liberal American than a liberal British person. <clears throat> because everything is very nauseating and shameful. And in fact, you know, I mean, you're speaking from Hungary, Christina, all sorts of... Yeah, that's why it's, I think, it's very... <laughs> so that's why very important to work with people, to so like invite people to to share their stories and also to create a history as a teamwork. I think it's it's quite useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Can help the processes. <laughs> well, well, we don't want to end on too um, impressive pessimistic a note. <laughs> I think, I think history I, as a teamwork you, is a really positive. Yes, uh, we, we haven't we haven't solved the world problems here. How we're going to go about this and create uh, world peace? <laughs> how, well, perhaps, how do we get into the last plenary thing? I mean, what do we have to do? Do you know? Well, we exit we exit this, and then if you want to go to the last uh, thing, you will go back to the the main page once you exit, and um, you will just enter it. And uh, uh, then they match you up. It's 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 very crazy. It's like this speed dating <laughs> thing where uh, you're just getting into talking to somebody, and boom, they disappear. Okay, you're on to the next one. So oh, yeah, that's very weird. It oh, is, well, but, it, but it's kind of fun to do. <laughs> I I want to write to you all individually because all your presentations have given me not only ideas, but I mean, like I have a tree person I want to introduce you to, Babs, who's in Lisbon. And all sorts of things like that. So I would like to um, say maybe we give we, we try to give this plenary session a role. We can all report back to each other. We can also all have a kind of 
you know, months later, anniversary Zoom or something. <laughs> yes, maybe, sounds maybe nice. Not Chrome. That's but, a great I mean, idea. I, I love think, that it's, idea. It's a nice idea. I think it's been very nice and it's been quite intimate. And now yes. we've got each other's websites. We know each other a little bit better. We can give each other, you know, mm. new ideas and things. Shall we yes. all, as it were, say goodbye for the present and see if we can get into Babs' um, speed dating situation? Um, and yes. before we go, Sarah, yeah. I definitely want to talk to you about St. Petersburg and and uh, William Jaffet. Because... Oh, righty-ho. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll At some do point, something. we have to do a Zoom <laughs> chat yeah, about exactly. that. That's my so paper funny. for him was called Cruel Art, and it was about Dali in the Spanish Civil War. It also seems quite relevant. It's online somewhere. So shall we right. all say bye-bye yes. for the present? Lovely artists. Yes. We so very oh, much yes. indeed. Thank right. you, everyone. Okay, okay, a month from now, we'll, we'll, we'll see you. We can do the thing. Okay. Yeah, see you on the report. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.